From straight line shorelines in Dubai to floating cities rising in the Maldives, the race to reshape Earth's coastlines has officially begun. This isn't a sci-fi movie, it's a geopolitical arms race with sand and steel instead of missiles and drones. But before we dive into the most mind-bending land reclamation projects ever attempted, hit that subscribe button, because these man-made islands being built will change the world map forever. Just watch. Let's begin where the impossible became a blueprint, Dubai. A city that stared into a desert void and decided to build paradise one grain of sand at a time. In 1990, Dubai's coastline was unremarkable, a flat sun-baked fringe on the southeastern edge of the Arabian Peninsula, a place where the sea met the desert in a straight and different line. No landmarks, no signature silhouette, just heat, sand, and horizon. But Dubai doesn't do ordinary things. By the early 2000s, that blank canvas had become a battleground for engineering audacity. It was no longer about expanding land, it was about redefining the concept of it entirely. From satellites today, Dubai doesn't just appear as a city, it looks like Earth grows new limbs. A place once defined by desert and modest harbors has extended itself into the sea, sculpting whole new geographies with ambition as its compass. Palm Jumeirah is perhaps its boldest signature. A palm-shaped marvel carved directly into the Persian Gulf, its fronds lined with beachfront villas, five-star resorts, and private pools that shimmer under the desert sun. This man-made archipelago alone added 78 kilometers of pristine coastline, an astonishing feat when you realize that's nearly half the length of Manhattan's entire shoreline. To shield this artificial Eden from the open sea, engineers constructed a crescent-shaped breakwater using over 7 million tons of rock, enough mass to stretch all the way from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, forming a 140-kilometer fortress against nature's tide. But this was never just about spectacle, it was about reinvention. Where there was once muted coastline and undeveloped shores, now exists a luxury corridor where Bentleys glide beneath glittering skyscrapers and infinity pools blend seamlessly into the horizon. Beachfront real estate that once didn't exist now ranks among the most coveted and expensive on the planet. Then came the World Islands, an audacious mosaic of 300 artificial islets arranged to mimic the shape of a world map. Each island is a blank canvas of possibility, marketed as an opportunity for the ultra-wealthy to own their own country. Some were transformed into extravagant private retreats, others, still waiting for their moment, sit scattered like pearls across turquoise waters, silent, surreal, and brimming with unrealized dreams. But Dubai's expansionist vision didn't stop at the sea. It turned inward too, toward the very heart of its heritage. Along the banks of an ancient waterway that once welcomed wooden dows and spice-laden sails, the city began reclaiming land to reimagine its roots. Today, Dubai Creek Harbor rises, a futuristic district of glass and steel poised to host the next symbol of ambition, Dubai Creek Tower. Designed to become the tallest man-made structure in the world, this spire doesn't just reach for the sky, it dares to rewrite the limits of vertical possibility. They aren't just building geography, they're building legends, sculpting stories into coastlines, and proving that with enough ambition, even the ocean can be redrawn. While Dubai engineered new land for luxury, the Maldives is doing it for something far more urgent, survival. Scattered across the Indian Ocean like jewels on blue velvet, the Maldives is a tropical paradise, but one that stands on a knife's edge. With an average elevation of just 1.5 meters, this island nation is one of the most vulnerable places on Earth to rising sea levels. In the past, storms brought waves, now they bring warnings. And so, the Maldives is doing something extraordinary. It's building its future before the sea can erase its past. It launched the Raz Malay project in December 2023. A $1 billion mega project with a monumental goal to create 11.5 square kilometers of new land, nearly four times the size of Malay, the current capital, which is already overcrowded and at constant risk of flooding. But this isn't just about reclaiming land, it's about reclaiming hope. The new islands aren't being built like the old ones. These are engineered to rise at least two meters above sea level with reinforced foundations, smart stormwater systems, artificial reefs, and climate-resistant infrastructure that can withstand the rising tides. Green corridors, solar energy grids, wind-buffering landscapes, it's an entirely new philosophy of urban design, born not out of luxury, but necessity. And while tourism still fuels much of the Maldives' economy, these islands are designed to be livable to house the country's growing population, protect culture, and anchor the Maldivian identity into a future that once seemed unreachable. If Dubai is the showman, dazzling the world with spectacle, then China is the machine, vast, relentless, and unapologetically strategic. 
To date, China has reclaimed over 4,600 square miles of land from the sea. That's not just a staggering number, it's more territory than the entire nation of Jamaica, created through sheer willpower and engineering muscle. But this isn't just about size, it's about purpose. It's about control. At the center of this titanic effort is a Tian Kun Hao, a dual fuel dredger often dubbed the Magic Island Maker. This leviathan of a machine can pump 6,000 cubic meters of sand per hour, enough to fill 15 Olympic swimming pools before most people have finished their morning commute. Working in tandem with dozens of other vessels, it transforms mudflats and shoals into metropolises. One of the most ambitious projects unfolds in the Pearl River Delta, where water once flowed freely between fishing villages. Now, towering skyscrapers, artificial arbors, and mega districts have emerged, entire urban environments materializing from blueprints and mud. But China's land building obsession isn't just about easing urban congestion or creating new homes for its people, it's about recalibrating power in the region. Take the Spratly Islands, a cluster of disputed reefs and rocks in the South China Sea. Over the past decade, China has transformed them into fortified outposts with airstrips, radar installations, and deep water harbors. These man-made military hubs offer not just intelligence capabilities, but symbolic dominance in one of the world's most geopolitically sensitive regions. This is territorial expansion without warfare, redrawing maritime boundaries not through negotiation, but through engineering. Land reclamation in China has become a geopolitical weapon. While others boast with bravado, Singapore builds in silence, and in that silence it rewrites what's possible for a nation without room to grow. Since gaining independence in the 1960s, Singapore has increased its landmass by nearly 25%. That's not a typo. A full quarter of the country, home to millions, is artificial. Carefully extracted from the sea, designed down to the centimeter, and executed with the precision of a symphony. One of the crowning achievements? Marina Bay. What was once a placid harbor is now a centerpiece of global innovation. Where waves used to lap gently at the shoreline, today stands the Marina Bay Sands, a $5.6 billion architectural marvel that looks like it was dropped from orbit. It's more than a hotel, it's a symbol of Singapore's philosophy. Dream ambitiously, build deliberately. That single development created over 11,000 jobs, reshaped the city's skyline, and has drawn 470 million visitors since its opening. It's a financial engine, a cultural hub, and a statement to the world, all on ground that didn't exist 50 years ago. And they're far from done. With a $1.75 billion expansion already underway, Marina Bay is being reimagined yet again, this time with an eye on climate resilience. Floating solar farms, artificial cooling lagoons, and dynamic flood barriers are being integrated into the next phase, proving that Singapore's approach isn't just bold, it's sustainable. Unlike other nations, Singapore doesn't have the luxury of sprawl. It's a nation born from constraint, turning limitation into precision engineered opportunity. Every inch of reclaimed land is a chess move, carefully calculated, strategically positioned, and built with future generations in mind. While the world looks up to skyscrapers, Singapore looks outward, into the sea and builds its destiny from the waterline. Now we head to Jakarta, Indonesia's teeming capital and the fastest sinking major city on earth. Every year, parts of Jakarta drop by up to 25 centimeters, swallowed inch by inch, not by earthquakes or erosion, but by something far more human, unchecked groundwater extraction. As millions of residents tap into underground aquifers for daily water needs, the land above caves in. And to make matters worse, the Java Sea is steadily rising to meet it. This isn't a slow-moving crisis, it's a ticking clock. By 2050, entire districts of Jakarta could be underwater. Floods already inundated some neighborhoods 13 times a year, and with climate change amplifying the threat, Indonesia was left with two impossible choices. Move the capital, or fight the ocean. They chose both. In 2019, Indonesia announced plans to shift its administrative capital to Nusantara, a purpose-built city on the island of Borneo. But abandoning Jakarta wasn't an option. Over 30 million people depend on it. So the government launched one of the most ambitious civil engineering efforts in Southeast Asia history, the Great Garuda Project. Shaped like the mythical bird that symbolizes Indonesia, this $40 billion megastructure is more than just a seawall. It's a 40-kilometer coastal fortress wrapped around the north of Jakarta like protective wings. It's designed to defend nearly 1,000 square kilometers of coastal land, including the financial heart of the nation. But it doesn't stop at concrete. The plan includes 17 artificial islands, new residential and commercial zones, and a complete reimagining of Jakarta's drainage and water systems. 
It's a city redesigned on a scale we rarely see, equal parts emergency response and urban utopia. Yet one haunting question lingers like a shadow over the blueprints. Can you hold back the sea if the land beneath your feet keeps disappearing? Even the most advanced wall can't stop subsidence. If groundwater pumping continues, the wall may soon find itself towering over not just water, but entire sunken neighborhoods. The Great Garuda Project is Indonesia's line in the sand, both literally and symbolically. But whether it becomes a triumph of adaptation or a monument to climate denial remains to be seen. Across the globe, another coastal country isn't just fighting the ocean, it's conquering it. Welcome to Eco Atlantic, a sci-fi sounding name for a real-life megacity being built directly on the Atlantic Ocean. Located on the edge of Lagos, Nigeria's commercial nerve center, Eco Atlantic rises from land that didn't exist two decades ago. It was reclaimed from the sea using over 100 million tons of sand, dredged and compacted to create a 10 square kilometer platform for the future. But Eco Atlantic isn't just about expansion, it's about survival. For decades, Lagos battled rampant coastal erosion with waves devouring up to 30 meters of shoreline per year. The solution? A seawall unlike any other, the Great Wall of Lagos. Stretching 8.4 kilometers, it's an engineering feat made from interlocking concrete blocks called X-blocks designed to deflect and absorb the full power of the Atlantic's fury. Behind that wall? A vision. Eco-Atlantic is planned to be entirely self-sufficient with independent power, water, and sewage systems. Financial towers, luxury apartments, embassies, marinas, and even an 8.5 kilometer private beach. It's not just a city, it's a statement. The ambition? Nothing less than to make Eco-Atlantic a new economic epicenter for Africa, a rival to Dubai, Singapore, or even Manhattan. But like all bold dreams, the questions loom large. Will this city truly be accessible, or will it become a luxury fortress for the elite? Will it inspire similar climate resilient cities across the continent, or end up isolated, disconnected from daily struggles of the rest of Lagos? One thing's for sure, Eco-Atlantic isn't just a mega project, it's a reclamation of possibility, a belief that the sea, while rising, doesn't have to drown the future. And in a world where coastlines are vanishing, that belief might just be the most radical thing of all. Let's talk about ambition. Not the kind that wins awards, but the kind that moves oceans. South Korea's Simon Gum is that kind of ambition, a staggering 409 square kilometers of land carved out of the Yellow Sea that's nearly two-thirds of the size of Seoul, conjured not by nature but by sheer willpower and steel-reinforced imagination. All of it cradled behind a 33.9 kilometer seawall so colossal that it earned a place in the Guinness World Records as the longest man-made sea barrier on the planet. But this isn't just civil engineering, it's civil warfare against nature, against time, and against global criticism. Construction began in 1991, and immediately, the tides weren't just literal, they were legal. Environmental groups filed lawsuits, thousands of citizens protested, the courts became battlefields. Why? Because the Simon Gum estuary was more than just tidal flat, it was one of Asia's most vital stopovers for migratory birds. Each year, up to 400,000 birds, including the endangered spoon-billed sandpiper, rested, fed, and refueled here on their epic journeys. And now, much of that ecosystem has vanished. Yet South Korea isn't backing away. They've doubled down. The vision is bolder than ever. Smart cities fueled by hydrogen energy, industrial zones that power Korean tech exports, floating solar farms that shimmer like mirrors on artificial lakes. Officials market it as a shining example of eco-friendly development. But critics see a contradiction, not a compromise. They argue that painting solar panels on eco side doesn't make it green, it just makes it palatable. The truth? Simon Gum is no longer a construction site. It's a symbol. A living monument to the 21st century dilemma. Can development be sustainable if it begins with destruction? And as steel rises where shorebirds once landed, the world is watching this grand experiment in real time. Malaysia didn't just imagine a new island. They dreamed up the Silicon Valley of the South and then drew it into the sea. Penang South Islands was originally a mega trio of artificial land masses that would redefine the coastline of Penang. But after pushback from environmentalists and fishing communities, the plan was scaled back to just one island, Silicon Island. Don't let the name fool you, this isn't a retreat, it's a strategic redirection. 
At 930 hectares, it's more than twice the size of Central Park. And unlike many land reclamation projects, this one wears its values on its sleeve. Its design brief reads like a sustainability manifesto. Carbon neutral buildings, solar energy grids, AI managed traffic, and climate resilient urban cores. Construction officially began in July 2023, kicking off with a jaw-dropping $850 million Phase 1, and that's just the tip of the financial iceberg. But money isn't what sets it apart. This project is trying to build the future without breaking the planet. Think of it as a proof of concept. Can you reclaim land without wrecking marine ecosystems? Can you build cities that don't drown in their own emissions? Skeptics argue that you can't solve ecological damage by pouring more sand into the sea. Advocates counter that Penang's coastlines are already sinking, and if climate resilience is the goal, maybe not building is the bigger risk. In a world grappling with rising tides and exploding populations, Malaysia is proposing a new blueprint. Don't just build land, build better. It's called the Lantau Tomorrow Vision, but since the day it was proposed, it's been a battleground for the present. Conceived in 2014, this jaw-dropping $80 billion proposal envisioned 1,700 hectares of man-made islands off the coast of Lantau, Hong Kong's Green Lung. The aim? Solve the city's spiraling housing crisis. Relieve congestion, reboot the economy, a brand new city in the bay home to over 1.1 million people surrounded by sea and skyline. But this isn't just a story of land, it's a story of life. Because these waters are also home to the Chinese white dolphin, affectionately known as the pink dolphin, a rare and endangered species whose very existence has become a symbol of the region's ecological fragility. Conservationists warn that dumping billions of tons of sands into these waters would push the species toward extinction. And the people? They pushed back. Mass protests, open letters, scientific papers, a chorus of voices rose in defense of the dolphins, and in 2023, the project was suspended. But not cancelled. Environmental impact assignments are still ongoing. The vision remains technically alive, hovering, controversial, and unfulfilled. Supporters say this is Hong Kong's last chance to fix its urban crisis. Detractors call it eco-suicide disguised as urban planning. So now, the project hangs in limbo. Caught between the desperate need for housing, the fierce desire to preserve biodiversity, and a city still reeling from political unrest. Will the future rise from the sea, or will it vanish beneath the waves of protest? The answer may define more than just Hong Kong's shoreline. It may define how the world balances life and land in the century to come. But what if we didn't just build on the water? What if we built with it? Blue urbanism is an emerging philosophy that challenges the traditional binary of land and sea. Instead of treating the ocean as a boundary or a barrier, it sees it as an extension of the urban environment. It's about designing cities that integrate with marine ecosystems, not pave over them. In Copenhagen, parts of the harbor have been transformed into urban swimming zones, where oyster beds filter the water naturally. In Singapore, floating wetlands and mangrove parks are being used as living buffers to protect against storm surges, while also reviving marine biodiversity and heavily urbanized waters. Imagine this. Wave power buildings that harvest kinetic energy from every ripple. Seawalls that double as vertical gardens for mollusks and coral. Or entire waterfront districts designed to flood safely during high tides rather than fighting nature at every turn. One of the most radical ideas, amphibious architecture. These are homes built on buoyant foundations that can sit on dry land during normal weather, but float during floods. In the Netherlands, this isn't science fiction. It's already happening in towns like Maasbommel, where climate resilient housing rises with the rivers rather than resisting them. Perhaps the most mind-shifting concept in this new era of water-centric thinking is what the Dutch now call room for the river. Instead of endlessly trying to hold back rising waters, planners are creating designated flood zones, parks, fields, and even entire neighborhoods that are designed to flood in a controlled way. It's a form of strategic surrender, acknowledging that water will win, but ensuring it does so on our terms. These spaces can absorb overflow during storms and then return to everyday use, blending ecology and engineering in a seamless dance. The world's coastlines are changing faster than ever. In the face of climate change, urban sprawl, and rising waters, land reclamation is no longer optional. But it comes with consequences, from displaced marine life to altered coastlines to billion dollar gambles that may or may not withstand the storms of the future. So the question is, are we building the future or rewriting the rules of nature? Share your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching this video with us and catch you in the next one.